Hello, time for another vlog. Um, I don't know whether I'm going to be doing these vlogs more frequently. It looks like it. I might as well. Um, it's maybe a format that is preferred a bit more by my viewers. I don't know. Uh, but it's... It's, uh, it's okay to chat about stuff, isn't it? Really? Um, I've just thought of another thing to chat about. Yeah. Um, right. Good. <laughs> um, so, a couple of vlogs ago or so, I commented on how so many species were losing their range. Um, like, a large proportion of the species studied had lost something like 80% of their range. And over the last century, um, and although they're not endangered species yet, because these these are common mammals um, in this particular case, um, within 20 years at this rate of loss they will be endangered species. In fact, almost all species that were studied would be in danger within 20 or so years, which means that we humans have to rein ourselves in real quick. Um, otherwise the ecosystems of the world are just going to be unable to support us, unable to support civilization. in fact. Um, <clears throat> and it looks like we in the West have to cut our consumption to about one-third of what it is at the moment. So lose two-thirds of the fluff and keep one-third, maybe. Um, that's how it looks to me. Um, and I'm thinking, can I cut my consumption that much? It seems to me, actually, I have already cut my consumption a lot. Because I cut my consumption in order to save money and in order not, and in order not to waste it. Um, not to waste resources in the world anyway. Um, but on the personal level, money is a measure of, of consumption in a way. Now, in London, most of my consumption goes on rent. So I can't really count that, because everyone has to live somewhere. Um, but in my other expenditure, I'm not re I don't really buy much. I mean, my place is kind of cluttered, but this is stuff accumulated over like 30, 40 years. It's not stuff... I'm not buying stuff all the time. I don't, like, have a car. I don't upgrade it every couple of years, like most people seem to think is normal. Because um, I don't have one in the first place. If I were to buy a vehicle, it would probably be a motor scooter or something like that. Um, although I don't feel the rainy climate here is great for that, but uh, and luckily, public transport is okay in London where I live. Outside London, maybe I would have to. <coughs> now, if I had a family, a car, I suppose, would be more practical. But I wouldn't be spending my money on some major gas guzzler. I'd just get some cheapo thing that can do the job. Like I did mini mini cabbing for a few years a while ago. Well not for a few years, a few years ago I did mini cabbing for about six months. And I paid two hundred and fifty odd quid for a second hand vehicle, right? It was it was a real rust bucket, but it did the job. Okay. Um I ended up spending at least as much on maintenance and stuff because that's the trouble with an old car. Um, but even new ones, you need to spend a lot on them all the time. So, and I found the mini capping not profitable for me. Um, but there you go. I did learn my way around London pretty well, though. Um, and actually, taking taxis is a way of reducing consumption. Because each taxi, if the driver takes like 20, does 20 trips a day, that's 20 people who haven't had to use their own car or even have their own car and for like a 20 pound taxi journey um, you can see that's that, that's like 200 journeys a year for the cost of owning a car because a car costs you several thousand a year because of maintenance fuel and depreciation in its value, i.e. you have to replace it every now and then. <clears throat> so that's a few thousand. You can spend less than that 
and get all the transport you need in taxis and public transport. Um, this is more practical for some than others, obviously. As a single person, that's easy. Um, <clears throat> especially living in a city where there's good public transport. Uh, it's fair to say that London probably has the best or close to the best public transport in the world. So it's easy here. I go outside, there will be a bus in five minutes, there'll be a train in two or three minutes, or a tube train in two or three minutes, or an overground train in 15 minutes typically. Um, and all within, what, a few minutes walk of my home, eight minutes walk to the most distant. So, easy for me to say. But the whole of our civilization might have to do this. Uh, cars are an efficiency, they are efficient in certain circumstances, but I think a lot of people could do without them. We, if we could lose the status symbol aspect of a car, I think we could get consumption down a lot. Of course, that's a big if. People, um, especially youngsters, young men want, want their, uh, their bird pullers, don't they? And you can't blame them for that. Um, it's up to the birds not to be pulled, frankly. So there. Um, yes, I blame the women. <laughs> That's right. Um, the, another problem is, of course, that reducing consumption is contrary to our economic system. Capitalism, corporatism, whatever it is, requires growth, economic growth. Um, and therefore ever-expanding consumption, ever-expanding markets, ever-expanding use of resources and environment on a finite planet. I've been reading the Agenda 21 program from the United Nations. And so far, it's like a... I don't know what the word is, but it's... Um, an apologist for free trade and, and expansion of trade. It's all about expanding trade. Making trade freer and easier, it claims, will be will put less pressure on the environment. So you expand trade, somehow you reduce the pressure on the environment. That's what they're arguing. Um, I've, I've only read part of it so far. Um, I think the reasoning is that when poor countries are in a huge amount of debt to rich countries, they have little choice but to chop down their forests and, and destroy the hardwoods in order to raise the cash to, to pay the, uh, the rich countries, the bankers, back. And cash crops and all the rest of it um, does come from this sort of pressure. So if instead they were not kept out of Western markets by protectionism, which is rife by tariff barriers and things of this sort and non-tariff barriers then maybe yes they could start to process their resources themselves um, sell them for higher prices develop their economies better maybe maybe there's some truth in what they're saying I think a difficulty is they cannot say the heresy that economic growth is a bad thing That's, that would be unacceptable to too many nations or too many leaders of nations and to the populations. We, the populace, do like to consume our junk that we don't need. And as long as we do, that's going to be a problem. Now, the millennial generation is a bit more open, it seems, to um, cutting back. A bit more open to cutting back. And, and we also have the advantage now of digital products where actually they're non-physical so the production cost is really very low um, and the cost on the environment is very low so that's great we don't need so many physical objects to be produced um, and maybe that will start to take the pressure off the environment one big problem is population is still increasing and we still need to build houses we still need space for them um, but there's a lot of talk now about pocket homes and co-housing um, plans and things of this sort where you'd have your own little space and you'd have shared space for the other families 
So you might have 10 or 20 houses in a community together where they have their own living room um, and bedroom and bathroom um, and maybe a kitchen space, but there will be a, a shared large kitchen space, shared laundry area, shared garden areas and things of this sort between the whole lot. And this would cut the consumption level back um, somewhat. And it would also uh, probably be better from a human-centred point of view, because in London it's pretty anonymous. I don't know who my neighbours are. I've seen them once or twice and say hi, but I don't know who they are. Um, but in these special communities where things are designed like groups of 20 houses or flats together, you live and effectively almost cohabit with the other people. You have your own private space, but whenever you're outdoors, you're going to see, th see some of them. Or if you go to the, the communal laundry or the communal kitchen, things of this sort, um, then you mix with the other people and the other families. And that would probably help reduce the sort of isolation and loneliness of big cities as well. So, But we're, in this country, only doing it in a very minor way. There's, there's, there's hardly any such schemes. And it's, it's, it's just being experimented with, basically. But it needs to be widespread somehow. And places are not designed with this in mind at present. Got 20 years to sort it out. Not long. Um, another thing which, which may help or may not, may hinder it is that robots are going to be taking over our jobs. Of course, over the next 20 years or so, lots of jobs are going to disappear and new jobs will appear, but not so many, I think, this time. In the past, in the Industrial Revolution, when automation has come along, although people were thrown out of work, new jobs were made available. So agriculture went to industry, industry went to service jobs, but now even the service jobs are being replaced and there isn't much. We may have art and culture jobs, we may have an explosion of culture and art, uh, movies and all this sort of thing. Everybody, including me here, we're making our own movies now, okay? Um, could be more professional perhaps, but we, you know, we're doing it, right? So we may see an explosion of culture. And this, again, can be done on the cheap, which is good, which is, is not much pressure on the environment, which is great. Could be something for that, uh, a way forward. Uh, we'll have to have helicopter money in the end. We'll have to be just given money by the state in order to keep the economy going. But I think the world's economy will have to run on a lower level overall. Um, and we'll have to be eased into it weaned into it carefully by our politicians. Has to be careful so we don't have like a revolution of people fed up because they can't get their goodies. Um, but digital goodies actually may be just the thing for most people. Um, and we can print our own stuff with our, with our own printers. We don't need big factories anymore so that may help as well. Um, the resources for those are easy, carbon-based stuff. We can print with that. Should be doable. Maybe. Another thing I was thinking about <clears throat> this week, different topic, acting and ego. I used to work at a film studio, a local film studio. It's, it's defunct now, I think, as far as I know, or at least it's gone from where it was, where I used to work. Uh, they moved up out of town a bit um, and in fact it all kind of exploded and people left in a in a huff and stuff when they had a bit of a well human organizations tend to reorganize every now and then let's put it that way um, and it was all I don't know it all broke up in, in kind of a bad way frankly because the uh, the director there was of the studio was uh, not the most pleasant of people. Let's put it that way. <laughs> I'm not going to tell the whole story. It would take forever. But uh, not just me, but lots of people left, uh, basically. Um, but they carried on. They made their movie. Uh, I mean, it apparently I haven't seen it. Um, Decline of an Empire, um, or Saint Catherine of Alexandria, was in fact as well, depending on which country you're in. Um, 
and as far as I know, they're still they're still doing something, but I, I don't know what it is anymore. I'm not in contact. But one of the things was um, I learned something of the craft of acting. I'm not saying I'm the world's greatest actor or anything, but I I, I was quite good actually. Um, and I observed that some people have a huge ego. They, they, they really need to be admired. A lot of people who go into acting are desperate for this admiration from others. Because um, in a way it's like they have no faith in themselves somehow. I don't know. I don't know how they manage to act at all. Because the question occurs to me, would a big ego be, be helpful to you as an actor? Because when you look at some of the big Hollywood actors, they are known for being egotistical, right? But then I think, well, actually, a lot of these Hollywood actors are not that great actors, in fact. What they're doing, most of them, is not character acting. They're just being themselves in front of the camera, which is not really acting. It's just being relaxed in front of the camera, which is what I do here on YouTube. Right? It doesn't take... I suppose it's a skill, but it's not the same skill as a real character actor who can actually make you feel that they are someone different. Most actors, you see them in different movies and they're really the same person again and again, just in a different story. Some actors, they differ from film to film. They, they really are a different person and that's, that's great. That's, that's a, a bigger skill. But it seems to me that having a big ego, not just in acting but in life, will block you. It'll get in your way of doing what you want to do. Because the thing about ego is it's kind of your definition of who you are or who you are supposed to be in order to be loved, in order to survive. You need to be like this. So to act, you have to go beyond those boundaries. You have to go beyond your normal self. You have to act like someone different who is not within your normal boundaries. So having a strong ego must, be, must make it really tough for some of those people to, to be different. Because they will feel silly, and they, I guess they just have to accept it. <laughs> they'll feel silly, they'll feel scared, they'll be terrified indeed. And some of them say, say as much as well. Um, it is scary until you've practiced a lot, of course. Um, hopefully you can practice enough to get used to it and not be scared anymore. Um, but it seems to me that even in real life, having a strong ego is going to get in your way, because it's going to stop you doing things that would... Um, keep you within your, keep you, allow, allow you to step outside your boundaries, it will keep you inside your boundaries. Um, because your body is physically capable of doing lots and lots of things, but we choose not to do lots and lots of things. Not just for moral reasons, but simply because we're scared of it. And that is ego, I think. Do you agree? Or is it something else? I mean, it's also a measure of your own ability, your, your, your emotional measure of your own ability on such things as well. You might feel you're just not competent to do such, such things, whatever they may be. So, okay, get competent. Fair enough, there are skills to learn. But some of it, I think, is your and my false definition of who we are supposed to be, which is fiction. I mean, on that note, I, I was actually thought this week that, that um, we behave as adults habitually, normally, in ways which are actually quite inappropriate when you think about it. When something annoys us, we, we, for example, I don't know, it starts raining, or a car alarm goes off in the middle of the night or something, and we go, oh, what's that noise? Oh, it's raining, darn, I was going to go out. <coughs> Pardon me. 
So why do we get angry? What's it going to do? I think we get angry because we have this subconscious belief that it's actually going to fix the situation. I mean, we know, as soon as you think about it, you know it's not going to fix the situation. But think about how we develop this habit as a baby. We learn that if we get angry and scream and cry, mummy will come along and fix the problem for us. All of the problems, as best, as best as is possible, right? And so we grow up, and when things go wrong, we get angry or upset. Only as an adult, no one is coming to fix it for us. No God, no mummy, no one's going to fix it for us. The habit is out of date. It's appropriate for a baby who's got no uh, ability to do anything much. And for children too, uh, to some degree, to a lesser degree as they get older, right? But as adults, it's completely useless. All it does is make us feel unhappy or unpleasant, and it doesn't fix the problem. As Eleanor Roosevelt once said, don't curse the darkness, light a candle. As adults, that's what we have to do. Getting unnecessarily angry and upset about things in the subconscious hope that this is going to fix it or get it fixed by somebody else is robbing us of our personal power and it's stressing our bodies, shortening our lives and generally stupid waste of time, um, basically. It's a tough habit though. <laughs> if I stub my toe, I know I'm going to curse. My, my toe, you know, or grumble, grumble. You could just say grumble, grumble. I mean, it's it's that's good. It's it's still along those lines, but it's very minor. It makes it into a joke. Maybe do that. Oh, that car alarm has gone off again. Grumble, grumble, grumble. I recommend the grumble, grumble, or grumble, grumble, grumble rule for everyone. It works for me. Um, so there you go. <laughs> Um, anything else? Oh yeah! This may have changed by the time this video goes up, but Trump and, what's his name, Mr. Flattop in North Korea, Kim Jong-un. I just remember he's a wrong-un, and that's how I remember his name. Okay, Kim Jong-un. Um, and they're ranting at each other. Oh, fire and fury. You, you know, you nuke us and we'll nuke you and all this rubbish, right? Okay. Is there a danger of nuclear war there? Not really, not much. I mean, it's not zero, but the chances are not zero anyway. What I think, I think we have to remember that diplomacy is different in Asia than in the West. In the West we're all very civilised about it, we'll come along for a tea party and we'll visit Disneyland or whatever um, with, the, with the various politicians and their wives and, and you know, try and be all civilised about it and just in the back room say, well, you know, on the side, do you think you could, uh, you know, do something about X, you know, just, just withdraw from that country for, for a bit, you know, please. And they'll say, oh, well, I don't know, perhaps we can visit Disneyland again, you know. And, and it's done sort of like that. Um, but I remember Obama going over to China or, or talking with China and getting nowhere um, because I think he was trying to use Western methods and they just think he's soft and do nothing, therefore. And I think Trump's bellicose approach may actually be more appropriate to Asia because they are more inclined, I think, to barefacedly threaten as a way of di doing diplomacy. Um, the way animals growl at each other but without really intending to fight. It's more like showing showing the teeth uh, and then just deciding who's got the bigger teeth and, and who's going to back down. So you don't actually have to fight. And I think 
Trump may be onto something. Uh, he he may be an absolute loon as well. It's hard to tell. Um, he, he's certainly wrong in certain aspects. I'm pretty sure there's global warming, for example, and he will post ridiculous tweets about it's snowing here. Where's global warming? Um, I mean, this is absolute imbecility, right? Um, but on this particular point, it may be reasonable, the, the best approach to to show show the fangs. Um, and at the same time, in the background, have the diplomats actually trying to talk. Uh, and I, I think the best way forward really would be to bribe them. Offer them development money in huge quantities in exchange for getting rid of the nuclear program. That's it. And in exchange for guaranteeing their country's survival, because North Korea knows that the West doesn't believe North Korea should exist at all. So let it exist. It won't be a, a locked down dictatorship forever, especially if it develops. Um, because they need it like that at the moment for survival reasons as they see it. So. Okay, I see the sunlight is getting on to me. Oh, actually, it's getting covered by a cloud now. All right, I, th I think that's enough vlogging for today. Any comments? Do you agree or disagree? Am I right? Wrong? Has the world been nuked by the time this video has been, uh, been uh, uploaded? If it has, hit the like button. Um, if it hasn't, hit, well, hit the like button as well. <laughs> okay? Um, okay then. Right. Bye for now.